And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us all the way from the hell that is time zones, and, and creator of Black <laughs> Void, along... And it, which is recent, which is going to be getting an expansion soon, in the form of Under Nebulous Skies, the one, the one and only Christopher Sevaldson. How are you doing yes. today, man? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on, or having me back. I did you say. did you just ha did you just have a pop about about me getting your last name right? Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen that often, you know. So uh, well done. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure you could write a small book about the number of times there's been um, somebody screwing it up. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm like I'm I'm 50 different people depending on how it's been pronounced through uh, through the years. So uh, so it's all good. Yeah. Um, is I'd hate I'd hate I'd hate to see what happens when when somebody tries to read when somebody tries to read your name when you get pulled over. <laughs> yeah, because you know some of the weird pronunciations have even been in my home country. So uh, it's not just because it's foreigners. Yeah, um, it could, it could be, it could be worse. Your your name could be written in Polish. True, true. <laughs> that would be uh, that would be even worse. Poland, I love I love you guys, but um, your language is hard mode. Accept it. It is. Yeah, it is. It um, is. So. I know it's been I know it's been a few, been a few months, but how but how have you been holding up? Good. I mean, um, been busy here yeah. during COVID. I yeah. mean, we, uh, we 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 released uh, Dark Dealings in the Shade Souk, which mm -hmm. is now in a hardback uh, mm -hmm. all across the world. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, we're almost done with another standalone called Into the Oblivious Depths, yep. which um, you can get as, a, as an add-on in the Kickstarter. And we are so close to done that as soon as the Kickstarter finishes, if we're funded, we're going to mm -hmm. send it to the backers that, uh, that got it. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then, as you mentioned, we are working on the uh, the new thing on the Kickstarter, which is called Under Nebulous Skies, which is a, a source book campaign and travelogue all rolled into one. Also, I feel like I feel like I um, restrained myself when I did that unimpressions video on Dark Dealings in the Shaded Souk. Mm. I was so tempted to make a fugitive or naked gun jo joke, and I didn't. <laughs> you could have it's fine i mean there's supposed to be humor in there as well i mean yeah. usually when i play we're laughing all night through so no uh, problem with that whatsoever i do i do think i do think even even with the subject matter of a setting like like black void i do think that there's plenty of opportunity for dark or even black humor sure um should be there for sure a lot Especially I mean, if you see, mm -hmm. if you look at some of the actual plays that are out mm -hmm. there, people are just laughing all the way through, especially me. So, I mean, there's definitely room for that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things where I, where I get reminded of a, um, of a, of a saying that Mel, that Mel Brooks had. Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> I guess that's sort of applicable for Black Boy, yeah. Because there is the tragedy in there, but take it with a take it with a smile. Mm -hmm. So, under, so with with um, so up and for 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 a good amount of time since Black Void's original um launch, you've been doing yeah. um so you've been doing scenario books, and I have um. I have four. I have four in my in my archives. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, dark dealings, in, dark dealings in the shaded sook, um, mm -hmm. the flight from Salvation Square, those who right. would be gods, and when yes. darkness falls. Yes. Um, but with but with under nebulous skies, um, this seems to be the, f unless I'm mistaken, this is the first true expansion of 
Black Void's um, sandbox. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Um, I mean, I've been contemplating it for a while, um, but I wanted to have enough uh, material to make it proper, so mm -hmm. to say. Um, and I wanted to make something that was a little bit for everybody, you know? So something for the players, something for the arbiters, uh, and something for just for those, you know, who, who really appreciates the setting. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it is, it is more of a supplement rather than just a campaign, but yeah. there is a campaign in there as well. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you've got this split up into three sections. Um, the yes. player's option, the Voidfarer's travelogue, and the Under Nebulous Skies um, campaign. Yes. Um, now, with the player's option, what can you tell me about some of the stuff that's going to be in there that's going to expand the sandbox of Black Void? Right. So what one of the things that I'm doing is that a lot of people have been asking when some of the other species will become playable. Mm -hmm. Um. And to be honest, I'm, I'm quite hesitant about that because sort of the concept of Black Void is that you are one of the descendants of Earth uh, and therefore within that. But what I have done is I've introduced new half-blood options so you can play half one of the known species. Not all of them, but some of them. So yeah. you can get a taste of what it's like to be some of the other species, but still remain within sort of the the original framework of Black Void. So now mm -hmm. you can play a half Talath, which are these huge sort of primitive savage species, or you can be a half Jeel, which is a more sort of it's a it's a sort of a a race that has sort of fallen uh, from on high and now has grown into decadence and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, and there's there's sort of a great variety of uh, of half blood species you can um, you can dig into, yeah. and on top of that we have also one of the one of the parts that I'm really really fond about is there's going to be a part about creating void vessels, how to uh, you know how to upgrade them and how to crew them and so on and so forth. So for the people that want to really sort of explore the cosmos, that's really going to be much more tenable now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm really excited about that part as well. Now, um, yeah. When it comes to when it comes to void vessels, um, yeah. and and void tr and void travel, how um, are a lot of times whenever the, whenever a, a RPG decides to include some section regarding ships, um, ships almost have their own sheet as if a as if it was a fourth character or or to put it another way, if you'll if you'll forgive me for sounding too American basketball with this, the sixth man approach. <laughs> um, yep. When it is that is that the case when it comes to void ships like like it'll like um it'll have a character sheet all to itself no it's not that's not my intent at least i mean it's still being tweaked and so on and so forth um but if you look in the core book you have some basic stats for vessels that are there in terms of you know number of crew that it needs to have number uh, or amount of cargo it can hold and so on and so forth mm -hmm. so it's more gonna you know remain along those lines and then maybe some bonuses in terms of the roles you do when you avoid travel and so on and so forth yeah but it's not gonna be as crunchy as as all that as you yeah. describe it will not because and... that's gonna take too much focus from the story mm -hmm. and and i don't want to see that yeah in that in that same vein, um, how, how do you feel? What's your feeling on the on the idea of void combat? Uh, oh, you mean between void vessels? Yes. Um, I have been thinking a bit about it because there's people that have been you know suggesting void pirates and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think where I am at the moment is that the likelihood of void vessels actually uh, even detecting each other, much less getting close to each other, is so remote that I don't think it's really going to be a thing that's going to come up. I might change my mind on that, but at the moment, it's not really something I'm looking into. Would it be more fair to say that there that there are big that there are bigger threats with void travel that to, so that um so 
so that so, something like Void Pirates isn't as mu- isn't as much of a thing. True. I mean, um, my playtesting group they did a Void Travel not too long ago, where they accidentally rolled a one on the Void Travel roll, mm-hmm. uh, which meant that you have some Void entities <laughs> that detected the ship and subsequently boarded it, and that was that was quite threatening. Um, so, so yeah, I'd say the, the native entities are much more of a threat than any sort of void pirate would ever be, probably. Mm-hmm. And what, now, when it comes now, um, obviously, obviously, there's been there's there's gonna there's gonna be new wep- new weapons and um and backgrounds. Um, yeah. Now, when now, um. I'll start. I'll start with the toys at, at the very least. Can you give me a few ex- a few examples of some of some of the weapons that are going to be added? You know, some of the fun ways for people to get maimed horribly. <laughs> I think some of the more standout ones is things like a man catcher, um, which will be featured somewhat prominently, um, uh, which is really going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have. A Sawaya dagger, which is basically a three-bladed punching dagger, which is quite cool as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have the Kapinga, which is um, originally an African weapon, which is sort of like a throwing axe kind of thing, but you mm-hmm. can use it in, in close combat as well. Um, so what I've done is I've delved a little bit more into what we in the Western world would consider exotic weapons. Mm-hmm. Um and sort of adapted those for uh, for Black Void. So I think I think you're gonna see some 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 quite new and interesting approaches to combat as well. Some with some new options uh, mm-hmm. coming in. And and these weapons are gonna be featured in the campaign as well. So they're really gonna be sort of readily integrated into the game already, and not just be you know, so, sort of superfluous uh, fluff that's there, but they're going to be active uh, parts of the campaign as well. So yeah. that's going to be really cool. Yeah. Now, it now it's also it's also mentioned new new um attributes. Yes. Now, with that with that in mind, are we ta- are we talking about um are are we t- are we talking about new new types of eso- of esoteric attributes or ha- or What's get, what's getting added when it comes to the attribute it's end a, of things? It's a bit of both. Um, there's going to be some sort of regular attribu- attributes, so to say, mm-hmm. um, but there's also going to be some esoteric ones. Um, one of the regular ones, for instance, is having sort of a, a, a snake bottom rather than legs, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the esoteric ones are there's translucence is one, for instance, which is quite esoteric, so to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there's going to be a, a bit of everything. I mean, yeah. some of it has has evolved through uh, the the adventures and campaigns that have been done, and some of it is uh, is brand new. Um, but it's uh, yeah, there's going to be added some more options mm-hmm. to uh, to create even weirder characters than you already could. Um, in that in that same regard. Are powers getting expanded as well? They're not getting expanded as such, but they're getting more detail. Um, some people have asked for more, um, let's say, more deep dives into mysticism, for instance. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely going to be part of it. I'm going to look further into uh, into Blood Inking, um and uh and so on and so forth so it's not i don't think you can say it's being expanded but it's getting sort of crystallized if that makes sense yeah i can i can make i can make sense of that um especially especially since the um some something that something that i do find i do find funny compared to other compared to other um other fa- other fantasy games is there there's a bit of the um there's a bit of the spe- of the spell book problem in, in a lot of fa- in a lot of fantasy games where right. where um and I and I know this cuz I did an experiment with, with with this a few years ago um where th- where there's where the pages pages of just spe- just spells or their equivalent in so- in other games 
um, mm-hmm. and the re- and the rest of the book is a little bit higher of a r- ratio than I'd have liked. Um, Pathfinder is a really is a really um, notorious offender with this, mm-hmm. um, but when it, but when it comes to when it comes to um, powers with both blood rituals and mysticism, yeah. the um, the um, the paid the ratio is v- much much smaller. Yes. Especially when you can, especially considering that this is a um, four hundred plus page um, core book. Mm. Um. So I'm, um, so with that with that kind of thing in mind, I'm get I'm. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that. Um, pa- that powers that are more that are more tied to the void all, are also going to be in that same kind of crystallization. Yeah, I mean, what I've done is I've I've listened to what uh, a lot of the people on our Discord mm-hmm. uh, Discord Discord <laughs> channel have uh, have been asking for and suggesting and so on and so forth. So we're definitely deep diving into the into the areas that they. And others uh, have felt that they would like to to know more about. Um, one of the things that we're going to do as well, but that's going to be outside the book, is I think we're going to sort of compile different uh, phenomenon, mystic uh, phenomenon, mm-hmm. because it can be for 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 beginners in Blackwood, it can be a little bit daunting having to come up with your uh, with your phenomenons all by your uh, phenomena all by yourself uh, in the early stages, so to say. So what I think we're going to do is we're going to compile these and just make them readily available for people, either on the website or, or in some other form, so that uh, so that we're sort of building, uh, let's call it a spell book, uh, to, to, make, to use a term that people know, uh, that's readily available but does not really take space from the actual books, you know? Yeah. Now... When it comes now, um, when it comes to when it comes to that whole crystallization thing, one I remember, I remember, I don't remember if I um took if I, I don't remember exactly if I took if I mentioned this and I did my initial review, but one of the things I had said is I is, I um I wanted I wanted to see some more refinement, or or to use your term crystallization when it came to blood rituals. Is that something that's planned? There will be some things, yes. Um, whether it's going to be to the same level as mysticism is is not quite determined yet, but there will be some things in there yeah. for sure. Um, I mean, what we want to do is is basically take what what people have been requesting or or things they haven't been entirely sure of. I would like to learn more about and really sort of dig deeper into that. Um, because clearly there's an interest within those fields, so so we want to uh, scratch that itch, so to say. Yeah. Now shifting to um, shifting to what um, equipment for for a second, because um, mm-hmm. one of the things that I had one of the things that I, I remember speaking very highly about was the inclusion of um, weapon and armor customization and the and the way that it works within mm-hmm. Black Void and. Are the are, is when it comes to the expanded weapons, is some is some of that also going to factor in when it comes to customized weaponry, um, pot- potentially getting expanded. Not at the moment. I might come up with some stuff before it's done. Um, but at the moment, it's basic weapons types only. Um, because I think, uh, no. Well, there are there are maybe one or two that I've already thought about. I just forgot about those. But I think we covered quite broadly some of the more weird variations of weaponry yeah. in the core book. Um, but there is, yeah, actually there is at least one or two new things. There might there might come more. And there's going to be, uh, there might be a small section on upgrades for shields in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, because some people have asked, if they wanted to use those more offensively. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to feature, you know, shield damage and adding spikes and, you know, different, mm-hmm. different things uh, like that. So I yeah. think that's going to be quite cool as well. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the Voidfarer's travelogue, 
Um, yes. I will. Ad- I will admit that whenever I think of the term travelogue, I think of somebody, um, somebody speak um, explaining the explaining the various areas and in, in, in where and where they're going um, in a in a semi first person approach. Is that is that a writing style that's going to be used with Void Fair's travelogue, or is it still very third person? It's still going to be very third person, but what I intend to do is have uh, more prose in there, which is probably going to be third person. Um, but I want to, I want to keep, I want to sort of keep the tone that was in the core rule book uh, in terms of describing the areas to make it as, let's say, accessible for the arbiters as possible. Yeah. Um, but. But I will add that sort of first-person view as well to give a more, let's say, ambient uh, sort of description of some of the things because I think that's one of the that's one of the aspects that really sort of appeals to uh, to the people that that like Black Void is that they get this sort of different feel to it and you 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 can sort of almost smell it as if you're there uh, mm-hmm. with these descriptions. So I definitely want to include that. But it's more sort of as an as an added bonus rather than, let's say, the core of it. All right, I, I got that. Now, when it comes now, um, obvious obviously, one of the one of the main things is in this is going to be expa- is going to be um giving a bit more detail on, so on some of the parts of the of the Eternal City. Mm-hmm. Um, now in per- in particular. W- I'm cur- I'm curious of of all the of all the dis of all the uh, districts. Um, what was what was the reason to focus on Kima and Dar- and Daris? Two reasons. One is that these are the two main districts where humanity is in the Eternal City, mm-hmm. which meant that to me that made the most sense for that to be sort of the starting point. In terms of that's probably where beginning characters are going to be because they're not going to really be able to get into any of the other districts unless they use subterfuge or stealth and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So I think that that to me made a lot of sense for 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 newcomers. Um, and I think those two districts are really quite interesting as well in terms of giving an idea of of where humanity sort of is, you know, this this sort of atmosphere that that they find themselves in. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that these are the two main areas where this part of the campaign uh, is taking place. So it kind of ties together. So even though the campaign is obviously more limited in where the scenes are taking place, the fact that the travelogue is there means that arbiters have, you know, the, the basis for really expanding on it. Or if if uh, if the characters want to go off the uh, off the grid, so to say, so that that it is readily available for for jumping out of out of the uh, the beaten path, so to say. Yep. And what now? Um, would it? I think it would be fair to say that Kima is the is the is the un, is the seedy part part of the etern, part of the eternal city. Yes, that's a pretty good description, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it's basically a case of what welcome. Um, I you could probably have a sign that says "Welcome to Kima." Please enjoy your counter your complimentary first stabbing. <laughs> that would be an apt uh, welcome. Yes, for sure. Um, so I'd, so I'd say it'd be fair for, for that would be fair to say that, that Kima is, is a place that would favor more, um, more, more cloak and dagger and more, and more backstabby types of, um, adventures. Yeah, that to a certain extent, yes. I think it would also be, um... It also lends itself to intrigue in terms of the, let's say the the different turf wars between the different gangs that are that are prominent there. Um, but on top of that, there's a certain level of 
uh, I guess you could say mystery that's being introduced as well. That was sort of touched a little bit upon in the core rulebook, but which is being sort of elucidated a little bit more um, in this because there is there is things or there are things under the surface that uh, that can be investigated that could really be quite interesting for the descendants of Earth to uh, to look into. But yeah, you know, on the surface, definitely cloak and dagger and um, and getting stabbed in dark alleyways yeah. for sure. Now, of course, I do like have I do like having a contrast with how on the other end of things you have the Dar Daris district, mm. um, which would it be fair to say that 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 it leaned more towards white collar adventures? It's yeah, it's more. Well, there's sort of different parts of Daris. Mm -hmm. There is the the whole wharf and docks uh, area, which is definitely in terms of you know merchant princes and trade and and underhandedness and um, not counterfeits, uh, illicit goods being shipped in and out and that sort of thing. So that's definitely there. And then you have the area where. Humans have their uh, have their enclave, which mm -hmm. is more. It's I guess it's more Kima esque in its in its state, but it's still with a different sort of view because it's not as violent. Um, and then you have sort of the workshop and forges and foundry area, which is more like sort of industrious and with uh, slave pens and cattle and all that stuff. So, but but it it leans more towards. Yeah, I guess you could say white collar or possibly blue collar as well. I guess, um, but it's it's with a it's with a sort of, of a different approach. So you you definitely get two different sort of settings, but still with an overarching sort of uh, ambience to it because they are both sort of the two meanest districts of uh, of Lin the Eternal. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um. Given that, given that, given that, especially especially with the um, uh, with the enclaves. Now it mentions the Firadani enclave, but the way the way that sentence was written in there, are is there more than one enclave that's de that's delved into? Yep, Beggar's Court is definitely uh, delved into as well. De Beggar's Court is in uh, is in Kima, mm -hmm. um, and that is definitely a focal point. Both in the travelogue, but also to a certain degree in in the campaign, if the characters decide to take that route, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but yeah, and and now is one of the the points as well with with picking particularly these two districts is that this is where you have two of the main enclaves. So I think that's a good sort of a basis for people as well to 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 start out with. So even if they don't run the campaign, or even if they decide to take it in a different direction and so on. It's something that's really relevant to to starting uh, characters uh, and also in the in the long run, obviously. And and the campaign also deals sort of with the let's say the internal politics between the different uh, human enclaves and even the assembly is is playing a part even though it's not being you know focused on as heavily as the other two. Um, but but sort of the intrigues and the political landscape between the different human factions is definitely something that's also going to be part of the campaign. Yeah. Now, within each within each section, I'm cur I'm curious if you've got plans for put for um putting a bit of asides when it comes to rumors that might that might work as um, story seeds for that particular area. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Same as you had the different plot hooks in the core rulebook, those are going to continue. Um, and like you're saying, probably rumors is going to be another aspect as well. And then it's basically up to the arbiter to decide whether the rumor is true or not. Um, so I think there's going to be a bit of both. Um, and also some of the plot hooks are going to be tied specifically to some of the NPCs that are there or specifically to some of the locations which means that it's going to be quite easy for an arbiter to you know if if the players decide to pursue a, a certain threat it's 
he's going to have or she's going to have some handouts, so to say, to, mm -hmm. to quite quickly come up with, with a fitting plot or a fitting storyline to go with wherever it is they're going. Yeah. But that being said, there's definitely, I'm leaving some, some areas blank. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, from, from my perspective, when, when I'm buying books, I want to be able to have areas where I can fill in whatever I want. Um, and I think probably a lot of, a lot of GMs uh, feel the same way. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be, into every little tiny detail. I, I think that would kind of defeat the purpose. Um, so there's definitely going to be some some blank uh, spaces for, uh, for arbiters to, to fill in themselves. But what we're doing is, is sort of giving the framework and then some specific things here and there, of course, that they can pick into. All right, that make, I can go with that. Mm. Um, now I know it, I know it mentioned break, bringing up pers um, pers personages. I can never get that I can never get that right. Fact factions <laughs> and the like. Um, yeah. With some with some of those people of interest, um, do you have do you plan on having some of them statted? Yes, some of them will be. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, some of them, it makes more sense than others. It kind of depends on the role that they're going to potentially play, you know? If you have people that might be antagonists or direct combatants, I think it makes a lot of sense. But where you have people that either are too high up or too low down or too you know, dealing within a different area, it doesn't really make sense to maybe have them statted out all that, all that much. But what I have is I have sort of different tiers in terms of, of level of detail. Um, as you can probably see, I think it's sort of, I think it's sort of really came into the fore in, in dark dealings in the shaded souk. Mm -hmm. If you look in the uh, allies, antagonists, and other NPC section there, you can see some have are statted out with a lot of details. Some just have sort of basic stuff, and some don't have a stat block at all. So yep. we're, I think we're going to continue that vein based on sort of the importance and the likelihood of, of them being needed so to say in terms of the stat box if that makes sense yep um taking taking that into taking that into account this is now this is a question i've a, i've a, i've asked um i've asked people if the people when it comes to that when it comes to their dm when it comes to their dming and design philosophy but mm -hmm. for lack of a better term do you stat dragons <laughs> Um, yes and no. Depends on which dragon it is, I guess. Um, because the whole, de the whole debate started be because, th because there's the notion of if, if it's got stats, then people, then players will try and kill it and get it and get XP for it. Now, obviously right. this sort of thing wouldn't apply in the case of, um, Black, Vo in the case of Black Void, because, um, you don't because, get XP for killing stuff. Well, well, there's there's that, and um, I'd say I'd say combat. I'd say given how combat works, it's something that you don't want to go wading into. Mm. Um, that's not to, that's not to say it's that's not to say it's complete. It's as discouraged as as extremely as as say Call of Cthulhu or some or something, but. If you do, but if you do it, it's ge it's generally the it's generally seen as a kind of worst case scenario or the tavern brawl getting out of hand. Yeah, it's gritty. I mean, one of the things that that I really try to do when designing it, which I think has worked quite well, is you don't probably have a lot of TPKs, but you have consequences for combat. So you will see. Let's say crippling injuries and so on happen quite often unless the, the the players use their wits and don't just you know start swinging swords whenever uh, they can um, because it's it's more designed to to have yeah like I said consequences rather than having character death all the time 
Um, and from what I've seen myself and from what I've heard from others, that seems to be working quite well. Um, and actually spurring players to, to think more about what they're doing um, and taking sort of more creative approaches as well. Um, and in terms of that, I think it makes sense to stat out the dragon, as you quaintly mm -hmm. put it. Um, because the thing is, it's not, um, it's not meant to be balanced necessarily. I mean, if, if characters want to jump in to fight an Anunnaki, they can, but they're probably not going to get out of it in any way they actually like, you know? Um, so I think the ones where it makes sense to stat them out, not necessarily just the combat skills. And I mean, that's that's one of the things, if you look at the stat blocks in, in Black Void, they're not all combat oriented. It's, it's just as much uh, about, you know, their social skills and what knowledge they may have uh, and the backgrounds and, and so on and so forth, as it is about which weapon they, they wield and how well they do it, you know? So in terms of that, I think it makes a lot of sense to to start out the dragons. Yep. And with and with that with that kind of thing and with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes um, when it comes to when it comes to the factions, um, yes, in in an individual faction's entry, would it would it um, outright state? Like who? Like who are the who are the other factions they get along with? Who are the other factions they don't get along with? And who they'd probably try and um they probably try and stab in the back if the if the opportunity came. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because particularly, well, actually, for both of those two districts, there's a lot of internal uh, struggle going on. In Kima's case, mostly between the different gangs. And in Dari's, definitely between the different uh, syndicates and merchant houses, and so on and so forth. So, so I think, yeah, that's that's going to be a huge part of it because that's also gonna, that's really gonna spur adventurers that want to go in that direction and really have, you know, the characters as either mediators or or becoming agents for one or several of these factions. Um, and, and build the whole intrigue and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there was it was touched a little bit upon in Dark Dealings in the Shaded Souk as well. Yep. Um, so, and to, I mean, to me, I like those kinds of games, you know, where you're trying to figure out who who's maneuvering how and why and, and what's the relationship to these guys and can I ally myself with this faction here to gain the upper hand against those guys over there and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. so that's definitely going to be a part of it because yeah those are those are some of the things that I find really interesting. So for sure. Yeah. Um and of course and of course I will freely admit that I'm using that as a lead in to have the situation where you play two factions against each other and, gen and then just watch back and watch watch back and they as they kill each other <laughs> while eating shish kebabs. Yeah, exactly. Which can definitely happen. I mean, especially in Kima, because there's generally a gang war going on at all times. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't probably take that much to stoke the fire. The only problem is if the victor finds out <laughs> that you did it and they're not happy about it, then you're probably in trouble. But uh, but that all adds to the fun, right? Yeah. Well, for, well, fortunate, fortunately, in a place as big in a place as big as the Eternal City, there's plenty of places to hide. This is true. This is true. But if you piss off the wrong people, you're gonna have to hide very, very yeah. well. Um, <laughs> and in the in that in now, give, given that given that opening um, giving that opening prose in the core book, um, do you have plan? Do you have plans for for um, noting wit noting which air um, if there are certain areas within. Within, say, the D Daris district, where hu where humans aren't looked on as aren't looked on as fondly. I mean, I know I know that's not saying much considering the state of the Eternal City, but <laughs> um, I think it's probably given that particular place. I think it's more sort of areas mm -hmm. or or specific locations. Um, I think one of the things 
that will continue with, as was also sort of done in dark dealings, is there might be certain establishments that are are more prone to, to civility towards humans than is the, the general case. I think it's probably more going to be if there are any extremes where you have people that are either uh, leaning towards that or who are more, more antagonistic. Um, because generally humanity, as you know, of course, is, is seen as either just vermin or, or, or something to be stamped out. Right? Uh, so I think it makes mostly sense in the, in the cases where that's not applicable. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be noted as well. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the third pillar, the, yes. ca- the, um, ca- the campaign under nebulous skies, mm-hmm. um, now I think now, unless I'm mistaken, this is again, this is going to be the first, because while you've done a handful of adventures up to this point, those yep. adventures have been standalones. Yes. And for this one, you're doing a full-on. Um, you're doing the fir- the first act in what in a tr- in a trilogy that's going to be a mm-hmm. full-on campaign. Yep. Um. Now, first thing first thing I was curious to ask was 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 this init- was this initially going to be a um a standalone, and then as you developed it more, just it just um expanded into. Um, something bigger, or did you, or did you want to do a um, grand campaign from from the get go? It was it was planned as a grand campaign for the from the get go. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, those who would be gods is is a campaign as well in in terms of the length of it and the amount of locations and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Dark Dealings is definitely a standalone into the Oblivious Depths, which is coming out later this year, and to backers at the moment, if they are, if they pledge for it, um, is sort of an in between um, because it's a standalone, but it's also quite extensive. It's 130 pages, so it can be sort of perceived as a campaign as well. Also, considering the amount of locations that that you can actually go through. But Under Nebulous Skies was always thought of as a grand campaign because I wanted to have this really sort of epic thing to to really sort of deep dive into into what it would look like to take characters from the very beginning up to to something bigger. And I think a, a cool way of doing that Mm-hmm. Was uh, was to sort of take them through the different districts of Lin, obviously starting with Kiman Daris, as well as some of the cosmic uh, and and border worlds and, and deep worlds potentially as well, um, and then sort of work work the way through all of Lin the Eternal. So mm-hmm. the one of the points is that the next uh, the next big one is going to focus on two different districts in Lin. Mm-hmm. And the campaign is going to take place at least some of the time in those two districts. Um, so I thought it really sort of tied everything quite nicely together in terms of introducing the entirety of Lin the Eternal to uh, to players and to arbiters for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so it was always the plan to have something something epic and have a sort of a grand finale uh, at some yeah. point. So so yeah. Now, one of the, now a um, a bit of a bit of a bad habit I I've seen with I've seen with some adventures, mm-hmm. and I don't and I want I want to make clear some this isn't a this isn't a universal thing but it is a trap I see enough to comment on yeah. is where is where an adventure um, makes it makes a bit too, makes a bit too doesn't um make itself explicitly clear what it what its what its tone is. So, okay. you, so you end up with the awkward situation of of a of a combat heavy table all of a sudden having to run subterfuge, um, <laughs> right? And give, given the variety of builds that yes. um, Black Void has, not just because it's a classless game, but sim- but because of the fact that it's a point based approach, mm-hmm. 
did was there was there um was there was there a concern in mind to to make sure that no matter what somebody's build they'll they won't be um left left sitting on their left sitting on their ass for a good chunk for a good chunk of a, of the story um one of the things that i always try to have in blackboard adventures is that there's a little bit of different um not necessarily genres but different approaches generally i always try to make sure that encounters can be resolved in different ways you know so that if the combat heavy guys want to go that way they can if the more sort of uh, diplomacy oriented group wants to go that way they they can if the more sort of stealthy or intricate or subterfuge people want to do that they they can generally there is a, an option for that as well um specifically for the reasons that you say because i mean in all the the play testing i've done and in all the the role playing i've done through the years you know people obviously they they tend towards different aspects so what i want to try to do is always have you know adventures where everybody gets to shine not all the time but so that they can sort of take turns but nobody is like you said left sitting just on their assets bird for three hours yeah um so 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 that's that's specifically one of the things that i try to work on and and, and one of the things that i tell the the authors that I'm working with as well is that I there's there's a couple of things I don't want I don't want railroading I generally want something where any major scene can be resolved in at least three different ways um, and so and that the scenes in in a lot of cases can be you know flipped around so that so that it takes a natural course uh, mm -hmm. for how the players want to to proceed um and then definitely that that there's a, a change in focus on what's what's really the target you know some some scenes are definitely combat heavy some are more with diplomacy and some are more with subterfuge and some is more with investigation and so on and so forth but i feel that at least so far it has been a nice mix yeah and and looking at that, I think that under Nebulous Skies is definitely following in in that vein. Um, and the playtesting I've done with it so far has, has definitely uh, shown that as well. Exploration is obviously a big part of Blackboard as well, and there's going to be there's going to be a lot of that as well. And and cultural encounters as well is a is a huge aspect. So. This campaign is, is going to go beyond Lynn as well, um, so so that's going to be really exciting. Um, yeah. I don't know if that. Yeah, I think that sort of answered your question. <laughs> um, and I'm get um, one of the, and I will admit one of the things I've enjoyed with with the adventures I've seen thus far in mm -hmm. Black Void's run is the is the fact that. There is the fact that there's multiple angles, and a, yes. a very a, a very if else approach to not just encounters but events. And I'm guessing that mm. tradition will will continue. Yeah, I mean that's how I do things, and that's yeah. how I ask people I work with to do things. And and if it's not to how I want it done, I usually tweak it myself. So most most things where I have other authors that that bring in their stuff. Uh, I can't help but tweak things and add things. It's just the way I work. Um, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, and given given the given the um, given what you said about other authors, I'm curious if when you bring in other authors, do you have like a um, like a setting bible for them to fall back on? I know that there's the um, core book and all, yeah. but. Um, do you have anything specifically for for them that that t that tells them what the general do's and don'ts are? Um, I'm I'm working and almost done on a writing guideline, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, yeah, I guess you could call it the Bible. Uh, on not so much the do's and don'ts; it's more in terms of uh, format and and the layout of things in terms of how 
to how to sort of fit it into what Black Void is, because I don't want to hamper their creativity. I mean, that's why I hired them, because I want them to be as creative as they possibly can, because I've, I've seen their, their other work, and I've, there's something about it that I like. So I don't want to smother that by you know, giving them, oh, it has to work within, within these very, very specific parameters, you know? So it's, it's more of a how to resolve different things in Black Void mm -hmm. rather than this is how to do it and this is how not to do it, you know? It's more sort of general guidelines uh, to, to, to support rather than to, um, to um, I guess, to, to lead, I guess you could say. Um, and, and, and in most cases, it's... Uh, it works out very well, and and in some cases it just needs a, a few tweaks. Uh, and and I think everybody that I have ever worked with have been it's been collaborative rather than contentious. Uh, so it's it's usually that we bounce ideas off of each other uh, and then end up a better place than where either of us started. I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's the writing guide is is more to support that and to give. You know, there's there's a guideline on how to name characters of different species because mm -hmm. with all the weirdness going on and all the alien and other world species, who's who's to get guess what's what, you know? Um so 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 that's that's the thing that's in there. Um also because otherwise a lot of the NPCs tend to have names that are either very similar, which makes a lot of things very confusing. So I think that's really gonna can help. I think the first time we really used that was in Dark Dealings, where at least to me you could you could get a sense of which species the different NPCs were based on their names. Um, it might just be me and not me in my head, but uh, but I'm hoping that's sort of coming across. Yeah. Um. And it's it's definitely it's definitely something like I can um, see. It's just. When you when you mentioned um, write, writers com writers coming in to tweak, that was something that came to mind. And I will note that the whole the whole um, setting bible or series bible that's a um, that's me bringing in an artifact from um, television, mm. where that where well the well the tel well television shows that are run properly will have that will have that kind of thing for um, for the writers and for the cast as well. Just so yeah. everybody is uh, is, the idea is to keep everybody on the on the same page, mm. so uh, so the whole show is presented consistently. Yeah. Obviously, there's ways to screw it up, but that's the i that's the idea of it. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the soundtrack thing, how yes. did how did this come about? Because I'm always I'm always in I'm always curiously intrigued when i see um the in when i see games outright put in an integration of music especially since a setting like black void feel feels like it feels like it needs a very distinct kind of sound that you're not going to find in rpg soundscapes right yeah um it came about in the way that i always wanted to have a soundtrack. It was kind of a dream for it. Um, I used to play music myself quite a lot. Uh, and I'm a very sort of auditive uh, person. And I had, before uh, the soundtrack was done, I had sort of built my own soundtrack that I used to listen to when I was writing to really put me in the right kind of mood and, and give the right sort of ambience. Um, and then what happened was that um, guy named Petja, also known as uh, Crafty Tabletop Stories, who was uh, who I was collaborating with. He was working on some of the animated stuff for um, for the first Kickstarter video. He had a friend named Philip, who out of the blue decided to compose uh, a little theme bit for for Black Void because he knew Petja was working on it. And they, he just sent it to me out of the blue, or Petja gave it to me out of the blue. And and I could just feel straight off the bat that he just nailed it. You know, mm -hmm. the the ambience were there. The 
the weird instruments were there. It had it had sort of the it had the feel that I was looking for. I mean, one of the all-time great soundtracks for RPGs, I think, is the the soundtrack for Planescape Torment, uh, the the old PC game, which is an amazing game, by the way. Uh, but 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 the soundtrack for that, I think, was just spot on. And I always hoped that I could could somehow manage to do something similar for Black Void. And Philip, he just he just got you know there were there was obviously tweaks and so on and so forth. But but the bases were there. He understood the the mood and the the exotic ambience and so on. And and he and I had a lot of fun making the first soundtrack. And since I have a musical background, I mean it 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 was. He's obviously a lot better than I am, but but it was it was like it was great discussions and yeah, can you tweak this and can you add this instrument and the the theme there should be recycled later on and so on and so forth. So I actually had tons of fun doing doing that process as well. So I'm very happy to be working with Philip uh, again on uh, on the soundtrack for this. So obviously he's made the theme for for the current Kickstarter video already. Which will be released to uh, to backers, whether we reach the uh, the stretch goals or not. Um, but hopefully, we can we get to do more because I think that's really gonna it it really adds some. And and we've released the tracks on YouTube as well, so people can use them free uh, when they play. And obviously, when you buy the books and the PDFs and so on, you you can download it as well, so you can have it in your library. Uh, but yeah, to me being being a very auditive guy, I feel that it really enhances sessions when you have music that that works with the setting and that fits it. Because if you were to use, let's say, your traditional Western European medieval tunes to Black Void, it just it wouldn't work, you know. No. It would just it would just throw you completely off. But this kind of otherworldly, sort of exotic inspired nitty-gritty kind of dark ambience that that philip managed to uh, to compose uh, that it just it does it so well so i'm i'm really excited about that aspect as well yeah um and when and of, and of course i'd i saw that um that at least now obviously i haven't list i haven't listened to it but the it it listed as at at the um time is ten is ten minutes, um, yes. Which obviously meant that e even for that one track, that's gonna that's gonna be a um a lot of content. How did you get, how did you get in con how did you first meet um Philip Melvon, who's the composer for this? Well, like I said, he was a friend of Pedja, uh, and then he just like he sent that uh, that initial track. And then we just uh, connected through. I used to use Slack uh, mm -hmm. quite a lot, and then we've just been going, you know, back and forth. And he's been sending me tracks, and I've been sitting and listening through to them, and then sending them back with notes at like at fifteen seconds, you tweak that or blah blah blah, all that stuff. And we just, you know, there's there's some people you just feel an instant creative connection to, and mm -hmm. he's luckily one of those people. So. So from the get go, we just we really sort of got each other and where we where we each were coming from, and I think there was a there was a synergy that mm -hmm. made the final results uh, better than than what either of us could probably have done on our own. But he is, yeah, you know, like I said, he just he got it, and 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 you know just through basically texting and chatting online that's that's mainly how we uh, how we communicate and uh, mm -hmm. it's worked out amazingly so on so far yeah and i i can um i can de i can definitely see i can definitely see that approach um when it can, now i've oh you've meant you mentioned that um you mentioned in the Kickstarter page that it that you're shooting for about 250 pages. Um, yep. What now? Obviously, obviously, 
because of because of the nature of of how I of how I do these things, I have to ask the obvious question because I get on everybody about this. Will the book <laughs> have an index? Yes. Yeah, I can I kind of figured it would, but it's but um given how given how some given how some people don't um don't want to put indexes in their in their books, it's one of those things that I have really? to focus on. I don't know. I don't understand why. Uh, um, I've only really given I've only really given people slack for not having an index if it if it's like a fifty page book. Yeah, that's fair. Um, um, but I mean, given given sort of the scope of this and that it is sort of three different different sections in one, it definitely needs an index, and it's it's something that people have have noted on as well that that they appreciate i've give, been given some pointers as well how to sort of improve it from mm -hmm. what it was like in uh, in uh, in the core book and also in terms of the uh yeah just basically some some ideas to how to make it better uh, that i'm definitely going to use for this but also when when i really sort of rework the the core book uh, mm -hmm. to improve it. Um, I think what's going to happen is that at some point, hopefully in the not too far future, uh, we'll upload a, uh, 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 what's it called? a tweaked version uh, to drive through and the Modifius shop and so on and so forth. And obviously all the all the backers from the first Kickstarter can get it as well, where we've, we've you know, because there's been some type and stuff like that so obviously we're gonna we're gonna try to tweak those and, and get that in order and then make it available to everybody again so they can have the newest and best version of the core rule yeah um and and i'll and that's definitely that's definitely something i'll i'll appreciate um mm -hmm. now when now um i real i realize it i realize that you that there's still a there's still a fair there's still a fair amount of days before the before the um before the Kickstarter en ends on November on November fourteenth, which, as an aside, give, given who I, given who I had in the uh, temple yesterday, I will note that you had it that you had a better choice of ending date than he did <laughs> than than, ja <laughs> than Jacob Ross did because his Kickstarter his Kickstarter and the end date for that is Friday the thirteenth of November, Ooh. which. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that would be sort of fitting for Black Void if I'd chosen that one. But uh... um, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, it's best not to tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> That's true. Um, but it's de it's definitely so it's definitely something I'll, I'll um it's definitely something I'll be keeping an eye on when it comes now. Presume now, presuming everything goes as planned, and just to make sure I don't jinx. Mm -hmm. What would what would you be shooting for as far as a release date of the um, PDF after all after all the extra paperwork and and stuff from um kick from Kickstarter? You know how it is. I mean, the goal is to have at least the basic version done around April twenty twenty one. Um, and I think that's that's reasonable and achievable, um, considering that quite a substantial part of the campaign is is both written and edited, um, and parts of the other two parts uh, as well. So I think that's uh, I think that's doable. I mean, I learned a lot from the initial Kickstarter um in terms of being overly um, um naive i guess you could say um but you know i want to be realistic but at the same time i want to i want to push myself because i want to get this stuff out to uh, to the backers obviously so i've set the deadline for for april and i'm, I'm really uh, adamant to to reach that i'm hoping that that it can um i think the uh, the artists are all really good at bringing in stuff on time and working quickly if needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's definitely a reasonable date to uh, 
for them to work with. Uh, a lot of the art is is done as already, but quite a substantial part of it is done already. So yeah, I think it's reasonable. I'm shooting for April at least, and then obviously what's going to happen is I'm going to send out bits and bobs as they get as they get more or less finished for backers to get back to me and, and give their uh, you know opinions and, and if mm -hmm. they spot any errors and so, on and so forth. So because I mean that's the thing about Kickstarter is it's, it's everybody can contribute if they want to, um, so to say. Yeah. So I want to do that, sure. And then, uh, and then the the hardback is gonna hopefully be released a couple of months after that. Mm -hmm. And like like I said, I don't I don't want to tempt I don't want to tempt irony on on the matter. <laughs> um, especially, well, you you know how you know how it is with the dice gods. No matter what, no matter what your background, race, age, gender, height, weight, whatever, the dice gods hate you. Yep, this is true. Which to me makes them to me makes them a model example of equality. <laughs> they hate everybody equally. That's true. Yeah. Um, the, I'll, de I'll definitely be, um, this, I'll definitely be keeping a close, a close eye on how, on how it, um, develops. Um, mm -hmm. and I can, and I can see the pos and especially with the travelogue, I can see the possibility of that, of that really expanding into, into just the daily life of the bit of the best, worst place to live in, the, in this new <laughs> Um, in this new humanity, um, for sure. And well, if so, well, if somebody wants to steal that line. That line I mentioned about co about complimentary stabbing. Um, go go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but once again, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come all the way up here and brave the hell that is time zones thank thanks earth for ha for for not for having to be around and dealing with a 15 hour difference <laughs> my absolute pleasure um and of course anytime you see fit to return which is something i get the feeling will ha will happen um in the future one way or the other sure um, the Definitely doors from my time the door is always open, and as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Oh, school. <laughs> exactly. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>